morning, I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. I've titled this message, Spiritual Apathy. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at this third warning passage in this epistle. It goes from verse 11 in chapter 5 all the way to chapter 6 and verse 12. If you remember, the first one we've already been through is found in chapter 2, first four verses in chapter 2, and a warning of a drifting from the word of Jesus. In chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 4, verse 13, A second warning is given of disbelieving the word of Jesus. Here in in our section today concerns the warning of being dull, if you will, to the word of Jesus. You'll find the fourth one in chapter 10, 19 through 39, essentially despising the word of Jesus, and finally... The warning comes in chapter 12, 14 through 29, defying the word of Jesus. I quoted that because I like the alliteration. It's a great way to remember it. It was an original with me. This comes from Tom Constable's notes, and I think it's very helpful to organize it. But I hope you see, this is essentially, as I mentioned before, the book of Hebrews is a sermon. It's an apostolic sermon. I think it happened to be preached by Paul and recorded by Luke and presented for us in a very uh, succinct and compact way in the book of Hebrews. That's uh, my opinion as to who preached it and who uh, recorded it. But nevertheless, it is an exemplar of the kind of preaching that you would have heard in the first century. And that explains why you have all of these warnings. It's a, though doctrine is given, truth is emphasized, and of course the overarching theme is the supremacy of Christ, and then at various points along the way, spread out throughout the whole epistle, great warnings are given to heed and hear the very message of Christ. Now this third warning section, verses Chapter 5, verse 11 through 6, 12, has been one of the more difficult warnings for people to understand. And there is great disagreement as to who specifically is being addressed and to what purpose. I mean, is this to believers or unbelievers or who is it to? Some of the phrasing you'll find in chapter 6 will seem at first glance to appear that perhaps it's a warning about losing your salvation. So those like us who might reject such idea, how would you lose something that you never found in the first place? That salvation is of the Lord, that he fulfills his promises. Jesus said, I will raise every one of them up on the last day. No one can take them out of my hand, and I'm secured by the Father. So, but yet it seems to be phrased that way by some who would hold that particular position. So it can be difficult then if you have a different understanding of the context of Scripture. I think what will be helpful in understanding this text, and perhaps all of Scripture as you look at it, would be not to look at Scripture to confirm your theological position, but rather to try to understand the intent of the author. What, what was his intent, and what's the context in which these statements are made? If you remember, you, you have an audience, the Hebrews, the Jews, that, that's essential. Th- these were beloved. These were brothers and sisters in Christ. It is 
a sermon that is given to a, primarily a Jewish congregation, something that was preached. And if you read through, and as we'll get to in the next few chapters, all of this mention of this Levitical system that carries on, it's an indication that this is not past, but certainly present. So prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, that's, that's about when this occurred, during the apostolic preaching years. The sacrifices were still going on. They were being pointed to. This warning here in chapter 5 through 6 is, is don't go back to that. You've left that. Go on to Christ. That's the point. They, these believers who had come to Christ, who were culturally enmeshed in Judaism, were being pressured by the culture, pressured by the society, the family, and all that they experienced in life to go back to where they came from. And in their case, it is Judaism. The only illustration I can think of contemporary that might be as strong for us to get in our mind would be, let's say you lived in a Muslim country. You grew up in a place like Saudi Arabia or Iran. And you heard the gospel and some person that was out preaching the words of Christ. And all of a sudden, something changed it wasn't some convincing argument that they gave, but they heard, you heard the words of Christ. Now Christ was glorious and gracious. And you, you recognize your alienation real before God and the fact that you couldn't uh, merit righteousness by, by your keeping of rules and regulations. That somehow wouldn't bring about righteousness. You knew that. But you heard that this gift of God was given to you in Jesus Christ who would merit all righteousness and who has proved it in his life. And beyond that, paid for the debt which you owed, sin, and has risen from the dead. And so you confess Christ as Lord. And what a glorious and great thing that would be. Except if you're in this Muslim country, could you imagine how difficult it would be? In fact, some who, and I'm, I'm, I'm not commenting on their courage and conviction, but I understand that. Um, it would be very difficult, and it is today. For those that come to Christ in those lands, many of them don't want to have a public baptism because they don't want anybody to know. Because for many of them, it would mean certain death. In fact, that's the legacy of, of these apostles. That's, that's the legacy of these early believers who came to Christ, for many of them, you know what it meant? It wasn't just a loss of opportunities, of privileges, of jobs, certainly was all of that. It wasn't just a loss of their family, but many of them died. They were martyred for their faith. And that's a difficult circumstance, and you can see why there was a great pressure then since in this context here in the book of Hebrews, why these Jewish converts then were being pulled, if you will, from every direction to go back to where they were. And by the way, I'll just set this out up front so that you make sure you understand the application. We're going to focus a lot on these Jews, their circumstance, and what was going on, that's to get the intent of the author, but understand that's the interpretation of the application is for you. And that's why we still have this. I mean, you, you may not have been trapped into Judaism, but it might be, it, it could be Islam. It could just be atheism. It could be agnosticism. It could be whatever hobby that you might have been involved with. <coughs> it might be just the cultural concept of things and this great pressure to go back to where you came from and where you were taken out of. 
For these Hebrews here, their specific situation is they're going to be alert, being alert to go back to Judaism. So this is why the preacher then emphasizes the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and that's a theme from beginning to the end. And by the way, that is a applicable to every circumstance you might be in. Look to Jesus Christ. Going back to anything other than Christ is going in the wrong direction. It is going to find an idol. It is moving towards destruction and demise. He will root this message in Psalm 110, saying that Jesus is better. He's better than all, and in their circumstance, if you remember as we walk through this text thus far to get to this point, he's better than the prophets. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. And now Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. <coughs> Jesus is better. Going back to whatever religious system, whatever ritual they had, is forsaking the reality who is Jesus Christ. Judaism is a religion of types and shadows. Christianity, Christ, he is the substance. Don't go back to that which pointed to that which is real, the person of Jesus Christ. This theme of his supremacy is emphasized here, particularly in some of these warnings of saying, don't, don't drift away from that. Wherever you're at, have you seen Christ? Have you come to him? Don't drift away. Have you come to Christ? Don't disbelieve. Continue in your faith. And now this warning is just don't be apathetic about it or dull. Don't despise him, he'll say again. And his final warning, certainly don't deny Jesus Christ. <coughs> the world and the world system, whatever it might be composed of, will lead you to apostasy, to a direction which you may never find your way back, and that's the warning. Do you want to go from away from Christ? <clears throat> the next time you're confronted, think about the crowds that gathered with Jesus in John chapter 6. And Jesus started teaching them this hard truth, his supremacy, and that he was more important than everything else, including the food you eat. And you know, a lot of people don't like to hear that message. It didn't sound so good. They were in for all the bread. They were in for all the wine. But they weren't in for the sacrifice. They weren't in for the tough times. And so when the massive crowd departs, Jesus had a way of, clear in a room. In John chapter 6 and 67, <clears throat> Jesus turns to those very 12 that he called and asks them this question. Do you want to go away as well? And that's a good question to ask yourself. Do you want to drift back? Do you want to go away? Do you want to abandon this one, Jesus Christ? Simon Peter's response, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's what you must know. What would you turn back to? The words of death? What would you turn back to? Unbelief? What would you turn back to? Satan? There's no choice here. 
Jesus is the Holy One of God. This application applies to everyone who beholds the Son. He must be that treasure of your heart that is greater than all, that you would sell and abandon everything to have Him and Him alone, that you would bear and endure everything to gain the prize, the upward calling in Christ Jesus. Look to Him. So in this case, it's a return to Judaism. It could be a return to any religious ideology, any cultural worldview. Returning to that would be a step away from the Holy One, a step in the wrong direction, a step away from the light into darkness, a step away from life to death. This message here is given to the church then. The congregants there who have this great pressure to abandon Christ for something less. It's an application of this for the whole community of God. Those who are genuinely regenerate and those that are on the precipice of belief. It is for the advocate of Christ. It is for the antagonist. And here it is even for the apathetic. All humanity, we point to one, that is Jesus Christ and his supremacy, and we call all men to repent and believe. We call all men to worship this one, the Holy One, the only one, and find their salvation in him and him alone and the resultant satisfaction in Christ above everything else. Everything else that you could give your heart to is idolatry. It is a wide gate that will get you into that. It is a very broad path. With Christ, it's a very narrow gate and a very narrow path. It is Christ and him alone. This preacher in Hebrews then is speaking to his congregants, emphasizing that it is Jesus Christ alone who is going to be your mediator. It isn't really this religious system that they had grown up with and that they were familiar with. They were good things, don't get me wrong. They were instituted by God for a purpose, and the purpose was to point to this one, Jesus Christ. So in our text, as we've read before, he compares him to Aaron. And Jesus not only qualifies as a human priest, a human high priest, which is necessary to mediate between God and man, you're going to have to have one among us, one that is connected to us, and Jesus fulfills all those slots. We preached about that two weeks ago. So he qualifies, but not only that, he excels in every point, in every aspect. Again, the point is to exalt Jesus Christ. Aaron holds no candle to Jesus Christ. Now in verse 10 of chapter 5, where we left off, the preacher brings up another type, another symbol, another shadow of the reality who is Jesus. In verse 10 of chapter 5, he says that Jesus Christ is then designated by God a high priest after, and see the word, order of Melchizedek. I talked about him briefly before, <coughs> and we'll hear much about him in chapters to come. The word Melchizedek, Melech means king, and Zedek is righteous in Hebrew. It's the king of righteousness is the term. But he's a priest, he, and Jesus is, is after this. 
It isn't that he's of the order, he is after that. That is, this Melchizedek points to Jesus. Jesus isn't of Melchizedek, he isn't of Aaron, he is of his own. He's unique in that way. This introduction to Melchizedek here in verse 10 then brings about a reason for the preacher to stop what he's saying and give a warning to the people. He's going to finish this warning in chapter 6 and verse 12. Notice if you're looking at your text real quick, verse 11, it begins with his issue, you're dull of hearing. Note that, dull of hearing. And then look all the way down to verse 12, and he gives him this exhortation then, don't be sluggish. These are two different words in English, but it's actually the same word in the text. They parallel. These are the bookends. He's saying, don't be lazy. That's the idea of dull. Don't be sluggish, lazy at the end. Don't become spiritually lazy, if you will. Instead, be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Characteristic of those that, are, that see and behold and savor the, the, the glory of Jesus Christ are not dull, <clears throat> sluggish. This is invigorating to look at the person and think on Jesus Christ. And this is why I've entitled this spiritual apathy, if you will. It is a warning then not to be dull, not to be lazy, not to be sluggish. Don't, don't be apathetic towards what is going on. This gathering together and worshiping Christ in the various aspects in which we worship. This should be the, the highlight and the most important part of your week. You can gather together with God's saints to glorify Christ. And we can unite our voices in praise to him. And this is pleasing to God. Don't be apathetic. Don't be dull. Don't be lazy. Don't be sluggish. That's the thing. You know why? Because spiritual apathy, sluggishness, laziness, it's going to lead to apostasy. And that's what he's worried about. It, it, you're going to lose out on blessings for sure. But it may be a result in the worst end of it, which is apostasy. Teach your children well by holding up the glory of Christ. So we'll go ahead and read this text then, <coughs> 5, 11, all the way down to 6, 12, and we'll just cover the first part this morning. But I'd like to read it in its context, this entire warning, first of apathy, and then in chapter 6, it really moves more towards apostasy. Verse 11. This is <coughs> responding to bringing up the idea of Melchizedek, and all of a sudden he stops and thinks about his congregation, and he says, about this we have much to say. About what? Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Jesus Christ is designated as a high priest after that order. We have much to say about this. And it is hard to explain. It's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled, in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And this will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have been once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God 
and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm and not holding him to contempt. For the land has drunk the rain and often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated. It receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed. And its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of a better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and your love and, and that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same eagerness, earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let us pray. <laughs> oh, Father, I do pray that we would be reminded of the glorious grace manifested to us in this person of Jesus Christ, our mediator now and forevermore. I pray that everyone here would express faith, true faith, in Christ. And may you grant us patience in this life, waiting for a day when we will inherit a promise that is beyond our imagination. May we be not little children who cannot wait for the glorious day of your appearing. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This warning here then, this, in this first section, if you noticed, it's really emphasizing the idea of spiritual apathy, laziness, sluggishness, and it's a dangerous thing. It, it, it isn't minor. If you, if you examine your own heart and you're no longer desirous of the things of God, it, it may be a, a way to communicate something great to you. If you find yourself in this way, apathetic, Lord, <clears throat> give me a great desire for you would be the prayer. Because it's very dangerous because it could very well be an indication that you are headed down to the path of apostasy. <clears throat> and by which, which we'll get into later, there may be a time in that direction in which that judicial judgment of God falls and there will be no way back where you can go beyond a point of return. And, and that is not communicated enough in our day. It's a dangerous thing to go down. It would be like sinking down to a certain depth of, of the ocean. I don't know why people do it. People do a lot of crazy things. I guess I do a lot of crazy things too, where you stress yourself. But people want to hold their breath and take a deep dive. And I've seen some documentaries on that. It's incredible how long they can hold their breath and how deep they can dive and where they even have to have procedures as they rise back up so that they uh, are able to survive that kind of thing, free breath diving, they call it. But there is a certain point in which somebody could go in which they will not return. And that has happened to many. That's the illustration here. It, it's, a, it's a great warning Sluggishness. Don't be sluggish. Don't be apathetic. <clears throat> Don't be lazy. Because it leads to apostasy. Now this preacher here, he, wants, he knows the people are <clears throat> aware of and have heard of Melchizedek. 
but they were spiritually apathetic about it in their understanding of it and recognizing this uniqueness on how that priest who brought bread and wine representing thankfulness and joy represented this king, priest, Christ who comes to bring that. You see, both aspects, that Levitical system, Aaron, who represented the idea of of sacrifice and atonement, and this joyous aspect of this kingly priest who is to come. Both of them typify aspects of somebody that is far greater. A priest who, who bears this sacrifice with his own blood to make atonement. And this priest who comes forward in great accomplishment, bringing thanksgiving and commemorating the completion of salvation. This preacher wants to hold up this this portrait, each one as a symbol, an object lesson, if you will. But he knows his audience is fixated on the former. And they're not going to get the fullness of the connection the significance, so he stops and really kind of chides them, gives them some admonishment. Look at verse 11, and the emphasis here is their problem is they're lacking spiritual discipline in their life. He says, we have much to say, it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. This much to say, what he wants to say is, all the connections between the symbol and the substance, between the the ritual and the reality. It is absolutely overwhelming. But they're not prepared to grasp the significance of it. it. It would be like talking about an incredible, complex math conclusion or solution to an elementary kid. You can explain it to them, but, and they can know some aspects of it, but they're not going to f- know the fullness of it because they haven't matured enough to be able to grasp it. And in their case, it wasn't a matter of age and time. It was a matter of, what, dull of hearing, lacking spiritual discipline to actually be prepared to receive a greater blessing. I mean, this is why you do the hard work of hearing, the hard work of listening, of learning, of reading, of thinking, of memorizing. It isn't easy. It's hard. But it builds a foundation by which you can know more and increase in your joy and glory of Christ. Paul would tell the church of Rome when he thinks about this glorious aspect of God, in Romans 11, I'll read it for you. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. You say, well, I have a hard time because I can't figure out God. (laughs) Welcome to the club. You don't have the capacity to figure him out. But just to see it, to, to, to think about it for a minute, it is, it is overwhelming. Look to the skies. Go try to measure it. Go try to find the final point. You'll never get there. And beyond our imagination, it's on the other scale, on the micro scale. We keep getting down to a lower level and a smaller level. And every time we finally say, well, we finally arrived to the bottom floor, yet there is another Can I tell you this? And I'm no prophet or a son of a prophet. We we don't have the capacity to get to either end. And you're going to find more. And what does that tell you? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. Oh, how great, how inscrutable are his ways and his judgments. Trust him. Not the quote-unquote science. Nothing wrong with us figuring something out. This speaks to the glory of God, but whatever we figure it out, it isn't complete. There's more. (laughs) There's always more. A lot more. Paul would tell the church of Ephesus, and here, 
I'll point out a few things. You might want to turn there and mark it. To the church at Ephesus in chapter 1, he talks about this God and prays that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's verse 17. So if, it, if, if, if none of that thrills you, here's an idea. Pray. Pray that he would enlighten you, give you this knowledge of his glory. That your eyes would be, and your, the, the eyes of your hearts, if you will, be enlightened. It means that heart here means mind. That you may know what the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints. Beloved, if, if, if we really had a grasp on that, our response would be in great glorious praise continually. I'm not saying artificially. I'm saying truly through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is beyond whatever you can think. I don't care what you have. I don't care how much you might amass. It doesn't compare. It's all going to be burned up. This will endure forever, this glorious inheritance. And, and, and beyond that, his power, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? This is the one who said, let there be light, and there was. There was light before there was a sun. There was a light before there was a moon. God just says, let there be, and there was. And when this creation is done, you won't need planets because you have God. God is the light. This immeasurable power, according to us who believes, what what could he do? He could cause somebody who is unregenerate and rebellious against God to completely change the direction of their life. Oh, Paul was an exemplar of that. He had inside experience, anecdotally, didn't he? One who was a hater and a persecutor for the church was the greatest advocate for it. What what kind of power it is? It, It is this great might. It's demonstrated in the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead and beyond that to seat him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above rule and authority and a power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That's Christ. Do you know him? In chapter 3, he'll talk about this gospel in verse 7 of chapter 3 of the same book. He says he's a minister of this gospel. It's a gift of God's grace. It's been given to him Paul, by the working of his power. That, that's how it is executed. It's all of God. He says, I'm the very least of the saints, and I was been given this to, to preach the, to, the, to the Gentiles, what? The unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Again, he's talking about this beauty and glory of Christ, you know it's hard to explain to someone who has an elementary knowledge of it, a superficial grasp. And it isn't just because they began in Christ. You've got to start somewhere, I understand. But they've been a Christian for a while. They've been in Christ for a while, these Jews. And they're hanging on and longing for those things that enslaved them before, rather than Christ. Paul will finish this section up in chapter uh, 3 and verse 14, and he's, he, he's praying. He's praying for the church. He says, from ever, from, for the church, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being, 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. That's a great prayer. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for your loved ones that they might grasp, that you might grasp, that we might have a greater grasp on Christ and to be filled with this fullness of God. For the church here at, with the Hebrews, this preacher is preaching, he says this is hard to explain all of this because the foundation on which to explain it is very shallow in their case because of their apathy towards these things. The glory of Christ is ultimately only for those eyes to which he has opened, the ears and the hearts that respond in obedience. In other words, the regenerate. It is for the regenerate, and, 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 it, and, I, and I mean it here. If, if, if there isn't some aspect in your own heart and mind, and, 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 you, and you can't even hear things that sound glorious when you hear about Christ, examine your own heart. Examine your ears that might be dull of hearing and respond in repentance and faith. Pray that he would show you his glory. I can tell you he will. Come. He's not going to turn you aside. This is not a trick or a game. This is a call for someone to come and, in humility, in repentance, in faith, and trust him. But the one reason it, it, it's hard to explain how great and grand it is because someone may not have eyes to see or ears to hear or heart to respond. And the other reason might be that it's so easy to be obscured by lesser things. Because here, I think that's really what he's emphasizing too in the church and mainly is that there's a lack of attention, discipline, if you will, to growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. As I mentioned before, th this is not easy. It doesn't come about by osmosis. Y you must engage yourself. Y you must work hard. He says, I've become, they've become dull of hearing here in this way it's phrased in our text. Because of sluggishness, laziness, apathy, you put in the descriptor. Paul would tell his young protege, Timothy, to be diligent. To be diligent in all, 2 Timothy 2.15. To be diligent to present yourself to God as one that is approved. A rester no a worker a slothful person no lazy no a worker hard work that no one needs to be ashamed and it specifically here is to get the word of god right spend time in it wrestle with the truth you will reap the rewards of your labor so this dull of hearing comes about through really for those that are in Christ, it may come about from a lack of diligence. And the second aspect is through discipline, a, a lack of it. And back to our text in verse 12 of chapter 5. Do you notice that? It says, he admonishes them that by this time, in other words, they were not new in the faith. They had been in the faith for quite some time. By this time, you ought to be teachers. However, 
You need somebody to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Oracles of God here are simply divine revelation. It are the oracles to which God has given his people. It often described the Ten Commandments and all of God's word as divine revelation. They were lacking an understanding of it, how those, in their case, specifically, pointed to this very one, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 7, I'll just try to walk through some of it if you want to turn or just listen. You remember the story. Here you have Stephen, first martyr of the church. Stephen, in his confrontation with the Jews, reminded them of these oracles of God, divine revelation, codified in Holy Scripture. And he told them in chapter 7 of Acts, verse 37, about Moses, who was a prophet, and prophesied that God will raise up for you a prophet from me, from your brothers. He's pointing to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And of course, he'll go on that what, what did they do when they heard this word, these oracles? Well, they, they persecuted those who told them the truth. They, they killed them, verse 52. They killed him for announcing the coming of the righteous one. Who, who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. Who's he condemning? The Jews here who are denying Christ, the righteous one, who Moses prophesied and the other fathers had talked about beforehand. He said, this one, now Stephen is talking to, to those that have confronted him. He said, they, they, they have betrayed and murdered. You who have received the law as delivered by angels, you didn't keep it. Well, how did they like his fire and brimstone message? Verse 54, they were enraged. They ground their teeth. You can see the fury that's going on. But what was Stephen doing? He was looking to Christ. He proclaimed the truth. He did so in a loving way. It is loving to warn of the wrath to come. He pointed to that righteous one, and they wouldn't hear it. But Stephen, verse 55 of chapter 7, he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And that's a, a beautiful imagery there of him standing and having attention to his saints. There, there, there's, there's no saint of God that, that dies in obscurity. We may not be aware of it. But I assure you, this one, the Holy One, he knows everything about it and shows this mediatorial work even here. He says, Behold, I, I see the, the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. That was their response. You know the rest of the story here there was a witness that had laid down the garments who had heard the glory of Christ proclaimed in the midst of this great persecution and death a young man by the name of Saul you know him as Paul and when they were done stoning Stephen he called out with a loud voice Lord Jesus receive my spirit. These Hebrews needed to be taught the connection, the relationship between the old and the new. Stephen was trying to communicate that, that the righteous one has come. It is Jesus Christ. And they wouldn't hear it. 
they need to be reminded, they need to be reviewed, and, and to bring about a, a remembrance that would cause them then to, to look heavenward to Jesus Christ, a treasure above all else. It, it is these scriptures then, all of them, this entirety of this Old Testament, that points to that one, the Holy One. By the way, this is why you cannot unhitch yourself from the Old Testament. And he's not suggesting that. This is where you learn the basic oracles of God, the foundation for our understanding in the world in which we now live, the nature of man, the glory of God, his expression of love and mercy in the redemption of Jesus Christ. This, to, to, to build further, you, you have to have a solid foundation. And these were necessary and important but they, they weren't in and of themselves to be isolated. Now that, the right, that they have been fulfilled, the righteous one has come. Now all of it fits together. And this is why we carry it around in a single book called the Bible. It is the full divine revelation, Genesis to Revelation, all of it. He would admonish the people, by this time you ought to be, you ought to be teachers. This is the trajectory for all who come to Christ. Not just to come to Christ and get your ticket punched to heaven. To get out of a hell free card, if you will. It's so that you would really learn of Christ. And if you know him, you can't help talking about him. A lot of you, and, and I do too, like various things whether it's sports, a hobby, something you're involved with, you can think about it. And you know, when somebody gets around you, you kind of talk about it occasionally, don't you? Sometimes a little too much because it's just part of you. That's the point in growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. It isn't that you're going to grasp all this and walk around as someone who just knows it all. You can't help but tell it. And that's the idea of teaching. Th this is the, the point. To, to, very, to speak the oracles of God, as Peter would refer, refer to them. And how would you be speaking them? Well, you, you would know them. And then be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And seeing the glory of Christ in his word, you can't help but explode with that truth. Serving, then, by the strength which he supplies. All scripture, all scripture is very much the breath of God. It's profitable for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And that equipping is so that you will be enabled, then, to, to, to not be apathetic, but to be um, in, engaged diligently with great discipline and can teach it to others. Oh, there may be certain gifts that are called to, to, to be um, a, a formal teacher within the church or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. But every one that is in Christ then is to teach. That's, that's what he's preaching to his congregation. You've become dull, dull of hearing. By this time, you should have been teachers. Who are you going to teach? Say, I don't have a class. Do you have other co-workers? Do you have people that you're engaged with in life? Are you involved with anyone that you can tell of the glory of Christ? They knew the foundation of that. You can find it in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Where even under the law it says that you are to take these things. And teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you're in your house and when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise. And it, it uses this analogy of even binding them on your hand and, and nailing it to your door. In other words, your life is saturated around the very oracles of God. And how much greater do, do, does that audience of the Hebrews have it? And how much more so than do we? 
Because here we have the, the full completion and fulfillment of all of those promises that pointed to the righteous one, the Holy One of God. And one of the reasons that that is not um, engaged in, he would say in verse 12, the last part, and then into verse 13 of chapter 5, you need milk and not solid food. He's calling them a bunch of babies. Milk's important. It's nutritious. But there's a time for that and a time to be weaned of it, lessened, if you will, and to move on to, to, to meat, to something more solid. Imagine, more difficult. Right? It, it, it's easy just to drink. It, it, Sometimes, uh, you, you know, you need to chew. That's the point. To be skilled is the explanation of this analogy. They were unskilled in the word of righteousness because they made no diligent effort to be skilled. If you want to go do something, whatever it might be, you're going to need to work hard at it and train, particularly if it's something that is grand and glorious. This is grand and glorious to Jesus Christ. It's grander and more glorious than anything else you ever imagined. So work hard at it. Be diligent. The word reward is, is grand and great. And one of the things it will benefit is discernment, and it's a big problem we have today. Look at verse 14. This solid food that he's talking about, if you're able to handle it, it is for the mature, who's had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good for evil. This constant practice is the discipline and the development of, that he's talking about. Discipline to get in. Development means this consistent amount of, of time and effort put into it. Doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's sort of like um, bringing up some sort of um, reading plan you, you, you read or a memorization plan and you work at it day after day after day. Before long, you, it, it, you, you have grown. And what are you going to benefit from it? And that is you'll have discernment trained by constant practice. Then you will be able to spot good from evil. And that is a necessary skill, particularly in our day. This word mature that's used here, it's solid food for the mature. It's, it's, um, it's a word here that is, is um, normally used to describe those who are regenerate and made perfect in Christ. Our standing before God is brought about by his divine work. But this also indicates an aspect, and that's how it's being used here, of, of, of growing, of maturing. It's not talking about your standing before God. It's talking about your standing before men. This perfection that he's looking here, it, as your apprehension of it, as your affections grow towards God. They'll grow and they'll mature. That's what he's talking about. A, a, a diligence, then, of effort develops into discernment or wisdom. Wisdom by which you're empowered by the Holy Spirit then. To gain wisdom in which you'll need to navigate in an evil age today. Paul would tell his young protege in 1 Timothy chapter 4. You can look at it if you wish. I'll finish out on this. Or I'll quote it for you either way. Chapter 4, 1 Timothy. He talks to Timothy, his protege, and he tells them to, to, to be train, verse 6, in the words of the faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. This is, this is what I'm talking about in discipline and development, to be trained by it, that is to learn, to put forth effort. And, and what are you putting effort in? The faith, doctrine, and then on the opposite side have nothing to do, verse 7, with irreverent and silly myths. 
That so you can discern truth from error, what is myth and what is truth. And he says, rather, train yourself for godliness. And then he uses the analogy that we're all familiar with about bodily training, of whatever kind it might be. It's of some value, it is, and we know. But however, godliness is valuable in every way. All the effort you might put into this, that, or the other thing, it's temporal. The effort you put in growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord is valuable, not just now, but it says for the life to come. And, and that's a strange phraseology if you think about it. What's that going to do in my eternity? Here's, the only way I'll explain it is this. It'll give you a greater capacity to see the glory of Christ. And you're a finite being. You're, you're increasing capacity to, to, um, to, glor- to, to see and behold the glory of Christ. I, I don't see that as a finite thing ever. In other words, it's never stopping because you're never going to get to the end of his glory. Follow me? But you're going to get a jump start on it. You, you, the efforts that you put here to bodily training to do whatever discipline that you want to do, you know, my, my dad was a professional musician. He's dead. I got all his instruments. He doesn't play a single one anymore. I miss him. I miss hearing him. And he put a lot of effort in it. But all that effort's gone. Now, it was beneficial in this life. I really enjoyed it. And so I'm not suggesting that there is no benefit in that. All I'm suggesting in comparison, can I tell you something far greater to invest time in? I'm not saying that's all you invest in at all, right? You, you understand. It's just a motivation like this preacher's doing. Don't be lazy. Don't be sluggish. This is going to help you right now, and the help you're going to get is you're, you're, you're going to have great discernment in this life, and you'll be able to enjoy Christ more. And guess what? Every bit of that you're carrying with you into eternity. He says, we strive and toil. We toil and strive for this end. And why do we do that, verse 10? Because we have our hope set on the living God. And then he tells his young Timothy this. Because Timothy is going to be a preacher at Ephesus. He says, command and teach these things. This is not optional, by the way. This is a command. Command these things. Verse 12, don't let anybody despise you. Be an example in your speech, conduct, love, faith, purity until I come. Do what? Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. This is one of the reasons you come here, you're going to hear the Scripture read. To exhortation, that's what I'm doing now. And we should do for one another. And to the teaching, explaining what's going on. Don't neglect this gift. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. It is trained by constant practice. And what's the benefit? You're going to save yourself and your hearers. Constant practice. It's a lifestyle, if you will, to enable you to be able to then distinguish from good from evil. And that's incredibly crucial in our day and the days to come. But a preacher from 100 years ago said it this way, Charles Spurgeon. You might have heard of him. He said this, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. False doctrine, beloved, is wrapped up in a blanket of truth. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Angels of darkness with the appearance of an angel of light. How are you going to discern? by heeding this warning of the preacher in Hebrews and recognizing that this spiritual 
Apathy is a gateway to apostasy, is of great danger. So there's a call then, beloved, to be disciplined, to grow or develop in the faith that you might be discerning. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you will bless the hearing of your word, accomplish what you will, bring all of us to life and liveliness in Jesus Christ. I pray in his name. Amen. Thank you.